Welcome back. When you first log into Windows, you will be presented with a desktop. Think of this as a tabletop or the surface of a workbench. If I'm working on a DIY project, I'd have several things laid out across the floor or on a workbench, such as tools or bits of the project. You can treat the Windows desktop in the same way, opening documents you need either for reference or editing, then clearing them away once they're no longer needed. Fortunately, with most modern operating systems, it can be a little easier to find whatever you need once it becomes buried under the piles of work that build up on most desks. Let's take a closer look at the various areas of the desktop. The bar across the bottom is called the taskbar. It consists of a number of sections. First, in the bottom left, is the start button. We used this in a previous lesson when I explained how to shut down the machine. It can be identified by the Windows logo. Some older versions of Windows had the word Start written on it. Within the Start menu, you will find shortcuts to most of the programs available on the system. You can also access system settings, as I showed you before. You can log off, restart and shut down the computer. The next box is called the Cortana Search Box. Cortana is Microsoft's digital assistant. It's much like Siri on the iPhone or Amazon's Alexa. You can enter any query or question into the search box. If you have a microphone connected to a computer, you can also use your voice to enter the search. If not, just use the keyboard. If you know the name of a program that you wish to run, Word or Chrome for example, enter it in the box and you can click on the search results to launch the program directly. You could also enter a question to have Cortana search the internet for the answer. The next icon is the task view. This is useful when you have many things open or when you're looking for something you have done recently. Click on it gives you a timeline view of your recent activity. It shows the programs and files you've had open and allows them to quickly be opened again. Then we have four icons that offer quick access to various programs. If you're using a corporate, school or college machine, you may have different icons. As standard, Windows shows shortcuts for Microsoft Edge the latest web browser from Microsoft. Next, the yellow folder, which is File Explorer. This allows you to access and manage files and folders on your machine. Then there is a shortcut to the Microsoft Store. You can find many different apps for Windows here. Some you'll need to pay for and others are free. Finally, there's a shortcut to the Windows Mail Client. The first time that you click on this, you'll be taken to a setup wizard that you'll need to step through to add an email account. Often, as I mentioned, in a work or education setting, the icons that you find here have been customised, perhaps including specific programmes used within those environments. Any programme you have open will also be shown along here, and allow you to quickly switch between open windows or programmes. You can also add your own shortcuts. I'll walk you through this in a later lecture. Next, a little further along the taskbar, is a people icon. This is fairly new to Windows. It allows you to add shortcuts to contacts and allow you to quickly write an email or to call the person. The next section is called the system tray. Here we see the now familiar icon, the network. Clicking this allows us to change the network settings. The battery icon shown its status, in this case a full battery and indicating that we have the power cord connected. It's also showing me a speaker icon which I can click on to adjust the volume. There's also the current date and time. Windows limits the number of icons shown in this section. You can click the arrow on the left to show other icons that there isn't space to display. This could be antivirus status, Bluetooth settings or many others. The last icon in the bottom right, looking like a speech bubble, is the Windows Notification Center. The speech bubble here is empty, showing that I have no new notifications. If this is filled in white with a number in the corner, it indicates that I have new notifications. The number showing how many new or unread messages there are. Notifications can be anything such as antivirus or the status of backups or new email notifications. Microsoft also has a habit of putting the occasional advert for new apps in here. That's a very static breakdown of each of these areas. Let's now take a look at how they actually work. As you saw in the first slide, this is the Windows desktop. It's pretty empty at the moment. We have the taskbar across the bottom here with the start button on the left. Moving to the right, we have the Cortana search box. 
Remember from the slides earlier, this is like Siri on the iPhone. I can use the box to search the internet or the local machine. For example, if I type a question, Cortana will search the internet for the answer. Or if I type in the name of a program I would like to open, Cortana displays a shortcut that I can use to launch the program. I could even use it to search for files and folders stored on the machine. Clicking any of the displayed results will directly open the file. To the right of Cortana is Task View. This can be thought of as a history or journal view of files and programs you have been working on. It can be useful for quickly opening files that you have worked on in the past, particularly if you can't remember the name of the file, but you know you were working on it on a particular day. Next, there's a few shortcuts, Edge, File Explorer, Store and Mail. Then across on the other side, we have the People icon, allowing you to create shortcuts to frequently used contacts. The next section is collectively called the System Tray. It includes visual representations of various programs running in the background, including the network icon, allowing us to change the network we are connected to. The speaker icon allows us to quickly adjust the volume or access various options and settings for the sound. The battery icon shows the current status of the battery. There may be other different icons here depending on the programs that you are running on your system. Windows only displays a limited number here. To see what else is running, click on the up arrow to see the extended list. Then we have the current date and time. If you click on this, you get an expanded clock and calendar. Quite useful if you want to quickly look up a date. If your system is linked to an active appointment calendar, such as Google Calendar or Microsoft Outlook, you will find an agenda view here with your upcoming appointments. Finally, we have the notification area. If your system has unread notifications, this will look like a white speech bubble with a number in the corner telling you exactly how many new notifications you have. If there are no new messages, the icon will look like an empty speech bubble. To view the notifications, click on the speech bubble. There could be new emails, system updates, suggestions for new features or upcoming appointments. Don't like the taskbar at the bottom of the screen? You can move it. Click and hold the mouse on an empty area, then move the mouse to the side of the screen that you would like the bar attached to. Perhaps if you've used an Apple Mac computer before, you might want to move the bar to the top of the screen. With the taskbar at the bottom of the screen, in the bottom left we have the start button. By clicking on this, we can access the majority of the functions of the computer. Just above where we clicked to open the start menu, there is a power button. Click this to shut down or restart the computer. As we work our way up, the next icon, looking like a cog, will take you into the computer settings. Next is the picture icon, which displays the picture folder on the computer. This is the default location for storing any pictures. Then there's a document icon. Again, click this to display the default location for storing any documents. The last icon in this list displays a small avatar for the currently logged on user. By clicking this, you can change account settings such as the password, lock the computer, which requires the password to be entered before the computer can be used again, or sign out, normally used to allow a different user to sign in. In the top corner, the three white bars expand this section of the start menu to make it a little clearer the options that are available. The next section of the start menu shows a list of all the applications available on the machine. At the very top are the most recently used ones. Below is a complete list of anything available in alphabetical order. The more you have installed on your machine, the longer this list will be. Just click on any item to launch it. This can be scrolled by first moving the mouse over the thin grey bar on the right. Click and hold the mouse button down on the bar that appears and drag by moving the mouse up and down while still holding the mouse button. The last area on the right of the start menu contains several tiles. At their core, these are shortcuts to various programs, but they are a little more than that. They are able to show live information from the application. For example, a weather tile might show you the current weather. By clicking the tile, it will open the weather application displaying the full weather report. A calendar tile may show you your next appointment. An email tile may show new email notifications. 
and a news toll may scroll through the latest headlines. To hide or close the start menu, you can click again on the start button. In this lecture, we have taken a detailed look at the desktop and taskbar, and we've outlined the purpose of the start menu. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.